Let's say you want to make a cake, but you decide recipes are for hack frauds, and even though you've never made a cake or cooked any other food before, or even seen a recipe, you think, I can do this. I've eaten cake before. I know what it tastes like. I could do that. You know it involves ingredients and heating, maybe sugar, maybe cream, but you don't know exactly what ingredients, how much, what temperature, or how long to cook for. But you decide to try anyway. Nine times out of ten in this scenario, you will literally burn the house down. In the other 10%, depending on what you did, throw in eggs, flour, milk, cream, sugar, sand, potatoes, wood chips, strawberries, cook for 8 hours at 400 degrees, 1 hour at 40 degrees, 3 days on a summer footpath, you will not produce cake 99% of the time. In the remaining 0.1% of cases, you might just have something that resembles cake, but it'll probably taste like wet horse hoof. You will not have made a satisfying cake. So, obviously, if you wanted to make a cake, you should have at least checked a recipe first, right? Right. So, why do you live your life thinking you can write a movie without understanding story structure? I love story structure, and I've made this video to convince you that you love it too. The structure breakdown I'm about to do to convince you of that is equal parts Blake Snyder's Save the Cat, and numerical data I've collected watching a bunch of movies, where the sprinkling of Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces just for flavour. For me, structure is about three elements that adumbrate a fourth, and I'm sorry to use a word that you don't know, but it's the right word, so here's a definition. The three elements are order, tone, and spacing. If you want them to rhyme, call them sequence, valence, and cadence. All a structure does is tell you what order the events should go in, the tone of the events, and how long each tonal sequence should last. So we've got our three components of order, tone, and spacing, or sequence, valence, and cadence. The thing they adumbrate is the theme the controlling idea at the core of a movie. People don't know this, but movies are actually essays on how best to live your life. The theme is the subtextual part of the movie that addresses this argument. It's what makes good art equipment for living. It's what makes The Empire Strikes Back the best Star Wars. It has the most to say about human nature, and it says it the best. Theme is why you need structure, and structure is how you get theme. The good news is that virtually all movies use the same structure, so you only have to learn one. And if you pay close attention to structure while you're watching a movie, you will unlock an extra layer of meaning that makes movies even better. So what is that structure? It's actually just three-act structure. But before you alt-tab back to your crypto tracker, let me point out that there's actually a lot of density to three-act structure. A bunch of stuff, events, beats. But these events come in a carefully arranged sequence. That's the order. Those events will shift predictably in tone. And the events are spaced with mathematical precision. That's the spacing. How mathematically precise? I'm going to show you this precision using a meter I came up with that visualizes the major turning points and beats of structure. Be nice to my meter, I'm a scientist, not an animator, so I made it in R, okay? It unfolds from left to right, and starts from frame 1 of a movie, and ends at the start of the credits. The numbers below the bar indicate the runtime in percentage. Why percentage? The runtime and therefore act lengths of movies vary wildly, but the proportions of the acts do not. If this doesn't make sense to you, just pause the video and think about it till it does. Draw some lines on a balloon and see what happens when you inflate it, or something. Okay. Ready? There are three acts. Act 1 runs about a quarter of the runtime and introduces one way of living. Act 2 runs a little over half of the runtime and shows us the opposite way of living. Act 3 runs about a fifth of the runtime and shows us a superior admixture of both ways. Overall, the three acts show us the most important events in a character's life and build up to a major transformation that the audience finds cathartic. But talking about acts is still a little abstract at this point. Let's get granular. There are six major events or beats you're looking for to decode structure, sprinkled across the three acts. Notice that these beats occur with the same order, tone, and spacing regardless of whether the story events are presented in internal chronology. For example, Memento has structure even though it's presented to us all jumbled up. We're now going to run through the structure of a bunch of movies you've hopefully seen, using the meter to illustrate our beats. Spoilers for these movies ahead. Act 1 has one of these beats, and it's the first one you should look for. Act 1's main job is to introduce the characters, setting, and conflict in a fun and engaging way. But there's one crucial beat in there that we need to clock. Let's call it the call to adventure. The call comes on average 10 minutes into the film, regardless of total runtime. And I do mean 10 minutes. I've got 40 films in a spreadsheet, and the average time till call to adventure is 9.92 minutes. Up to this point, the story has been establishing its protagonist and setting, and hinting at the conflict. There have been plenty of events before this moment, but none as important as this one. The call is the knock on the door, the phone call in the night, the letter in the mail that will ultimately upend the protagonist's life. 10 minutes into Spider-Man, Peter Parker is bitten by a genetically engineered spider. Just under 8 minutes into The Matrix, Neo is told to follow the White Rabbit. 13 minutes into The Empire Strikes Back, 
Luke is told by old Ben to go to the Dagobah system. Seven minutes into The Wolfman, Larry Talbot spies a cute girl in a shop using a telescope, which was completely okay in 1941. Which, by the way, yes, this movie is from 1941, and structure is even older than that. Nine minutes into Dodgeball, Peter Lafleur is given 30 days to pay back $50,000. Seven minutes into District 9, Vickers van der Merwe is chosen to lead a mass eviction of aliens. Sometimes the call is less obvious, or only obvious in hindsight, or when someone much smarter than you points it out. Ten minutes into Groundhog Day, the innkeeper asks Phil Connors if he will be checking out today. This existential question will haunt him for the rest of the movie, so it acts as a kind of soft call. Regardless of its form, the call to adventure is the first domino to fall in the changing of our protagonist's life. The events before this moment showed us why the protagonist has to change. Peter Parker is an undeveloped loser. Lafleur is a total slacker. Phil Connors is a sarcastic solipsist. The events after the call will chart their change into more actualized people, dragging us, the audience, along for the ride. But not right away. Following the call to adventure, there is always a refusal of the call. Will our protagonist answer the call to adventure? Or will they stay in stasis, spiritually never clicking away from YouTube? The reversal of the call runs from the call itself until the end of Act 1. That's the internal order of Act 1. Setup, call, refusal. We sense the protagonist's life is incomplete in some way, and we want them to change, but we're not sure they have what it takes. The refusal sequence dramatizes that conflict. It is dominated by a tone of doubt. The protagonist spends this section finding excuses not to answer the call. Sometimes there's an action scene. Sometimes the girl isn't interested. Sometimes the antagonist intimidates the protagonist here. Sometimes it's not clear what's happening at all. But the prevailing tone of this section is one of doubt. There is tension over the unresolved question of whether the protagonist will answer the call. At the end of this sequence, we get the second of our six major beats. This is the moment where the protagonist finally answers the call to adventure. The tension resolves. The protagonist commits to leaving the comfortable, familiar world behind. Because you have to leave the comfortable and the familiar to find anything new. This is the transition from Act 1 to Act 2. Up until now, we've been meeting the major characters and learning about the world. For example, in Groundhog Day, every major resident of Punxsutawney is introduced or hinted at in Act 1. But remember, Act 1 shows us one way of living, the unchanged way. Now that's done, we're ready to dive headfirst into the adversity of change. We're going to enter Act 2. The choice to answer the call to adventure usually happens a quarter of the way into a film's runtime. In my spreadsheet, the average is 26.33%. That's the spacing, or cadence, of Act 1. 25% into The Matrix, Neo takes the red pill. 26% into The Wolfman, Talbot succumbs to his animal urges and wangs a wolf on the head. He's bitten for his troubles and soon becomes a werewolf. 25% into Dodgeball, Lafleur and his average Joes commit to playing Dodgeball and dig up an instructional film. 25% into Groundhog Day, Phil stops doubting the magic of the time loop and decides to exploit his predicament. Sometimes it seems like the protagonist doesn't have much choice about entering Act 2. In District 9, Vickers is sprayed by some alien goo, an event that seems out of his control. But a few minutes later, 25% into the movie, he is given a very clear option to back out of his situation and return to base. What does he do? No, no, just, just get it checked out. I'll just have it treated by the minutes. He chooses to go into Act 2. Very few films reach this beat before 25%, but many take a bit longer. 28% into Spider-Man, Peter Parker decides to make a costume for himself and make some money to impress Mary Jane. It isn't until 30% into Empire that Luke actually sets a course for Dagobah. And it's almost 32% into Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, before Will Turner answers the call of the sea to rescue his beloved Elizabeth. Why do films always reach Act 2 by 30% in? Probably because Act 1 can't sustain much tension beyond that time, which is variously 20 to 40 minutes of screen time. How long can you sit there in the cinema waiting to see if the protagonist will accept the call to adventure without firing up the baby monitor app on your phone to see what your dog is doing at home? That's your second major beat out of six, and it hits one quarter to one third into the film's runtime. It's usually followed immediately by a symbolic swallowing into a new world where everything is different. In The Matrix, Neo chooses the red pill and is immediately consumed by a mirror. He wakes up in an unfamiliar place that is exactly opposite to the one that he started out in. Here, the tone shifts. The doubt is over, and now we get a chance to see what we came to the cinema to see, the fun of the upside down act two. The tone of events is going to be relatively light-hearted for a while and the pace a little slower. Peter Parker revels in his powers. Neo learns Kung Fu. Will Turner takes to the high seas. Luke meets up with Yoda on Dagobah. Vickers begins to transform and experiences dyspepsia at a party. 
Lafleur and the average Joes begin their dodgeball careers. Phil Connors seduces local townsfolk, steals money, and eats gluttonously. And some comic relief shows up in The Wolfman. I think of this section as the honeymoon. Blake Snyder fans will know it as fun and games, where you get the kinds of moments that used to go in posters and trailers, back when trailers weren't complete garbage designed using fMRI machines that exploit viewers' brain responses to maximize involuntary engagement and no, that isn't a joke. The honeymoon is like a little trip away after a momentous occasion, where things aren't so serious for a while, and it's going to last for about a quarter of the film's runtime. In this section, a very special side character, or several, will be introduced. Campbell calls this supernatural aid, or the unexpected assistance that comes to one who has undertaken his proper adventure. Snyder calls this the B character. The B or supernatural aid character is crucial to understanding the film's theme. They reflect the protagonist's spiritual journey, rather than their physical journey. The physical journey is the one you thought you came to the cinema to see, but the spiritual journey is the one that keeps you coming back. The B character is usually the one to talk most explicitly about the film's theme. You see, I skipped over this, but usually in the first 15 minutes or so, a film's theme will be raised explicitly, although often obliquely, by a side character. This theme is the precious jewel of life advice the film is trying to show us, but we're usually too dumb to notice consciously. It's the thing we're trying to understand by learning structure. Remember, every film you see is about a single controlling idea or theme. It is an essay on the pros and cons of that idea, and it always picks a side by the end. That theme is raised early, and then echoed here in The Honeymoon. 13 minutes into Spider-Man, Aunt May raises the idea of manhood. You're the most responsible man I've ever known. 30% into Spider-Man, Uncle Ben lectures Peter about responsibility. A little under four minutes into The Wolfman, the idea of curses is raised. Let's develop what amounts to a tradition about the Torbert Sons. 26% into The Wolfman, the old gypsy woman is the only person who speaks of Talbot's curse with compassion. Less than a minute into Dodgeball, we are invited to contemplate whether it's good to obliterate your identity in service to your ambitions. You don't have to be stuck with what you got. 29% into Dodgeball, reluctant lawyer Kate Veach asks protagonist Lafleur, Is it strictly apathy or do you really not have a goal in life? 10 minutes into District 9, we hear that rules matter. There are rules. We all live in by rules in this world. 26% into District 9, Vickers takes up with Christopher Johnson, an alien who refuses to bow down to bureaucracy. Two minutes into Groundhog Day, the news anchor raises the idea of living in shadow. 27% into Groundhog Day, Phil Connors begins to thaw thanks to the presence of Rita's sunny warmth. The B character is usually introduced here in The Honeymoon, and they teach the protagonist the theme. Peter Parker eventually internalizes Ben's sermon about responsibility as a form of love, and this is what enables him to defeat Norman Osborn in the end. Talbot cannot overcome the curse of lust placed on him by a callous god, and is killed by his own father, symbolizing the cyclical nature of the curse. Thanks to Rita's example, Phil Connors learns to bring light and warmth to the lives of others instead of his own, which is what breaks him out of the time loop in the end. And being around the prawn Christopher teaches the bureaucratic Vickers the difference between rules and morality. Ben Parker, the Gypsy Woman, Rita, Christopher Johnson, these are the B characters in their respective movies. The supernatural aid. Notice that the theme is never something trivial or quotidian, like whether bunny rabbits are cuter than guinea pigs. It's always something deep, resonant, and universal. How should adults conduct themselves in the world given the power they attain during puberty? Can we escape our animal nature? How do we pursue ambitions without losing ourselves? When should we break proximate rules in pursuit of ultimate rules? How should we process dark or difficult times in our lives? These questions are huge and weighty and, astonishingly, they are explored in those bright, colourful things you pay $20 to go and see every once in a while. The best part is, movies always answer their own questions. So if you're learning film structure, it's good to pay attention to the B character. It's how you can learn from the story, how you can use the equipment for living. But if you miss the theme and the B character's introduction, that's okay. It's hard to clock, especially the first time you watch a movie, which is why I haven't included them in my list of six major beats to look for. Still, keep it in the back of your mind, because it'll come up again later, and it's the thing you should work on learning once you've mastered the basics of structure. Now, much like an alien invasion or the bland grayness of a Marvel movie, there's no mistaking the third of our six events, the midpoint. Halfway into a movie, that's 50% of the runtime from the first frame to the start of the credits, everything shifts. A lot happens in this midpoint. First, the stakes are raised. 51% into The Matrix, Cypher reveals that he's going to betray everyone. 48% into Spider-Man, Peter Parker sews a new, better suit. He's going to fight crime for real this time. 50% into The Wolfman, Talbot sees a wolf and freezes up. The curse is ruining his life. A little over 50% into Jurassic Park, the T-Rex breaks out. 50% into Dodgeball, the action shifts to the big tournament. 51% into District 9, 
because his wife Tanya rejects what he has become. Second, some kind of time pressure is usually added at or just after the midpoint. In Spider-Man, Jameson launches a crusade against Spidey. In The Wolfman, the old gypsy woman prays for Talbot's soul. In Black Pearl, Elizabeth is sent ashore as a sacrifice, putting a timer on Will's quest to save her. A third function of the midpoint is for the protagonist to reiterate their resolve. Sometimes there's a public coming out moment here. In The Godfather, Michael finally commits to his family's way of life at 51%. In A Clockwork Orange, Alex steps forward to volunteer for the Ludovico treatment just before the midpoint. You're absolutely right, sir! Fucked up, bleeding hole! And then, at 50%, signs his life away. A fourth function of the midpoint is to advance any love story that's being told. 52% into Groundhog Day, Phil seems on the cusp of seducing Rita. You might remember the midpoint of Titanic being the collision with the iceberg, but it's actually this. A fifth function of the midpoint is to check in on the progress of the theme. The B character is almost always present at or just around the midpoint to help you with this. Vickers turns to Christopher Johnson for help after the midpoint of District 9. Kate shows us it's possible to have ambitions but retain your identity just before she joins the team in the midpoint of Dodgeball. Rita seems to be falling for Phil halfway through Groundhog Day. And if you want to see an example of the most perfect midpoint, The Empire Strikes Back adds in Campbell's atonement with the father. The stakes are raised as Luke realises he's fighting against himself and nothing will ever be the same again. The midpoint is a massive turning point in the film's trajectory and everything changes after this point. In that way you can think of movies as having two halves, before the midpoint and after. And it's not just movies that do this. What happens halfway through Macbeth? Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. Macbeth sends bandits to kill his best friend Banquo. His descent into malevolence is now irreversible. What happens halfway through the Iliad? The Trojans push the Greeks back to their ships. The tide of battle has turned and the stakes have been raised. This beat, like all the beats, is older than cinema. In my database, the midpoint hits on average 49.91% into a film's runtime, so just a little before the halfway point, but close enough to 50% that it can't be a coincidence. So we've reached the midpoint in our order, which in terms of spacing is halfway through. What comes next? Tonally, it's always the same. And then things get worse. What's the first thing that happens after Jack and Rose consummate their love in Titanic? What happens after the T-Rex breaks out in Jurassic Park? What happens after Peter Parker commits to being Spider-Man? What happens after Cypher makes a deal with Agent Smith? What happens after Luke confronts himself in the cave? What happens after Vickers is rejected by his wife? What happens after Phil is caught manipulating Rita? The tone of the film changes. Things get worse. For every victory the Joes win in Dodgeball, the antagonist's team also wins. Vickers finds himself alone and increasingly desperate. And what follows Phil's rejections by Rita? This stretch of the film lasts from the midpoint until about 70%, when the fourth of our six major beats arrives. On average 70.29% in, the worsening reaches a climax. The timing is actually quite variable, anywhere from 65% up to 75%, which is two thirds to three quarters for those in the cheap seats. But in this moment, the protagonist reaches a new low point, and it is the lowest point in the story so far. As Blake Snyder keenly observed, this moment is often accompanied by an actual or spiritual death. Tonally, therefore, this is a moment of reckoning with mortality. 67% into Groundhog Day, Phil says, I've killed myself so many times, I don't even exist anymore. 66% into Spider-Man, the Green Goblin captures Spidey and tortures him with threats of death. 66% into The Matrix, Cypher starts unplugging people, killing them. 68% into Black Pearl, it seems that Will Turner has died in an explosion. 70% into Empire, Luke is disturbed at the possibility of sacrificing his friends and abandons his training. 73% into The Wolfman, Talbot goes to the church to seek absolution from God, but he's turned away, exiled from forgiveness. 76% into District 9, the landing craft is shot down, and with it, Vickers' hopes of being turned back into a human. If there's a mentor character in the movie, they die here, but rarely the love interest. For example, Ben Kenobi has his final confrontation with Darth Vader in this moment in Star Wars. And do you remember what happens 68% into Dodgeball? The coach is killed in a freak sign accident. 
In all cases, the protagonist is worse off now than at any other point in the movie before this. This low point beat is crucial because it forces our protagonist to confront themselves and to decide whether they are really committed to changing, which we hope they are, generating tension in the audience. The protagonist will um and ah for the next 5 to 15% of the movie's runtime. Blake Snyder calls this stretch the dark night of the soul. Usually in this section, the protagonist expresses some doubt, and the people around them, especially the B character, help convince them to continue. Tonally, it is introspective, tender, and uncertain. In Spider-Man, Peter finally gets his chance to connect with MJ as a superhero. In The Matrix, Neo comes to terms with the fact that he may not be the one. In Empire, Chewie rebuilds 3PO, Lando betrays Han, and Luke is too late to save him. In The Wolfman, Talbot tries to turn himself into the police, a hunter, the doctor, and his father. No one takes him seriously, and he's confined to his family home. In District 9, Vickers and Christopher Johnson are captured by mercenaries, and then by Nigerian gangsters. In Dodgeball, Lafleur takes a bribe from the enemy, tells Steve he isn't really a pirate, and goes AWOL. The Joes fall apart without him. And in Groundhog Day, Phil finally realises and verbalises the truth that he's not good enough to deserve someone like Rita. At the end of this sequence, the protagonist has done their soul searching. They have found what they need to go on, often with the help of the B character. They've survived Act 2 and they've learned and changed as a result. But have they changed enough? That's what we're about to find out. The beat at the end of this sequence is the fifth out of six. It is the moment where the protagonist leaves Act 2 and breaks into Act 3. On average, this event comes 78.48% into a movie, so let's call it four fifths. This beat is usually accompanied by some discussion of the theme. 76% into Groundhog Day, Phil commits to improving the lives of everyone in Punxsutawney, not just his own. He's ready to reflect Rita's light onto others. 78% into Spider-Man, Peter rejects the Green Goblin's offer to join him. Peter has internalized Uncle Ben's message of love over self-advancement. 78% into The Wolfman, Talbot succumbs to his curse once more. 79% into Dodgeball, Lance Armstrong shows up to give Lafleur the pep talk he needs to go back to his team and win the big game. 81% into District 9, Vickers steps into the alien armature sent by Christopher Johnson's son. He is ready to integrate his human and alien elements to break some rules. We've finally gotten out of Act 2, which usually runs 50 to 55% of a film's total runtime. That's its spacing. It showed us the upside down world of challenges the protagonist needed to face in order to change. 78% into the average movie, the protagonist has changed and is ready to step into Act 3. Act 3 shows us the melding of the two worlds from the previous acts. I think of Act 3 as the final exam. Has the protagonist learned the theme or not? This act will test them. Act 3 usually starts with the protagonist gaining some momentum thanks to their new direction. The tone is always one of tension, as the test itself has high stakes, the protagonist's very soul. The protagonist starts by gathering resources. Guns. Lots of guns. They take the fight to the villain. Often, there's a big action scene here. Sometimes it's the climax of a tournament. In a tragedy, it's the protagonist's last hurrah. But this tone does not last. The tension of Act 3 builds and builds. Will the protagonist pass the exam? Halfway through Act 3, 90.23% into the average film's runtime, there is a reversal. Something unexpected stops the protagonist dead in their tracks. This is the sixth and final beat we are looking for to understand film structure. Tonally, this moment is a dark surprise. You'll note that in terms of spacing, the reversal is the perfect complement to the call to adventure. Where the call comes around 10% from the start of the movie, the reversal calms 10% from the end. It's like poetry, it's sort of, they rhyme. In the reversal, the tension is ratcheted sky high. 91% into Spider-Man, the Green Goblin gains the upper hand. 89% into Dodgeball, the Joes are defeated by their rival team. 89% into District 9, Vickers is forced to break his own rules so that Christopher Johnson can get away. Sometimes this beat hits a little earlier or later. 84% into Groundhog Day, Phil discovers that he can't save everyone. And if your film has a twist, it usually goes here too. Again, the ultimate example of this is 91.5% into Empire. And if your love interest dies, it usually happens here, and I'll show you an example of that later. This final event forces the protagonist to draw on everything they've learned to overcome their antagonist. They must be graceful under pressure, and they must show that they have internalized the theme to succeed. Spider-Man reveals he already has a masculine role model, and he doesn't need Norman Osborn. Lafleur dons a blindfold to symbolize his lack of vanity, and overcomes his antagonist in the name of his team. He finally has an ambition he cares about. Vickers keeps fighting long enough for Christopher Johnson to get away. 
he has finally learned the difference between what's legally right and what's morally right. Phil takes inspiration from the old bum's death. He has learned that there is true death in winter, but that's partly what gives it its beauty. He has learned the value of his own shadow, as well as the limits of his light. And if this is a tragedy, this is where we reach the cathartic climax. Talbot's own father clubs him to death, finally ending the curse of lust that he himself passed on. All that remains after this moment is the denouement, which runs 5 to 10% of the film's runtime, and then we reach the credits. The denouement is a great release of all the tension that's been building up for two hours. It's the bit that leaves us feeling washed clean after a good movie. It's also a chance to reflect on the theme, and we should always end on visual evidence that the protagonist has changed the world by changing themselves. Without this evidence of change, the film will feel hollow, indistinguishable from the life you're trying to escape by watching movies in the first place. So that's an overview of film structure, but I can tell some of you still aren't convinced. So let's go through an entire film from start to finish and put this information into action. Let's choose a relatively recent movie that a lot of people have seen, say Amazing Spider-Man 2. I will spoil this movie and its predecessor, so if for some reason you haven't watched them over the past decade and you would still like to, go and do that now. Let's wind back our meter to the start, and we'll clock the six big beats as they come up. The film's runtime is 132 minutes, but I'll express the turning points in minutes and percentages so you don't have to calculate as we go. Okay, let's go. Right from the start of the movie, we're oriented towards imagery of time, subtle as a brick to the eye socket. A mere two minutes in, Peter Parker's father says, I always thought that I'd have more time. Combine this with the imagery from earlier. This is the theme. The movie will be about how to live your life when you know it has to end. What should you do with the limited time you have? At minute 12, Peter Parker is visited by the ghost of Captain Stacy, a character who died in the reversal of the previous film. The unexpected appearance of this ghost will change Peter's trajectory in this film. This is the call to adventure. It is a reminder that death is inevitable. At minute 13, love interest and daughter of the deceased, Gwen Stacy, is giving a speech. What makes life valuable is that it doesn't last forever. Time is luck. Make yours count for something. This is a further elaboration of the theme, but Peter isn't ready to answer the call just yet. He's not ready to live his life like he's going to die. He keeps playing it safe. He breaks up with Gwen so often that she breaks up with him. He acts as Spider-Man, but there's not much passion in it. He's just killing time rather than valuing it. But at minute 33, 25% into the film's runtime, Peter hears that his friend's father has died. He is moved to act on this information, although annoyingly, this mostly happens off screen. Regardless, he's finally ready to take mortality seriously. He enters Act 2. Later, at minute 39, or 30% in, he goes to visit his bereaved friend Harry. Harry functions as the B story here. He responds very differently to mortality than Peter does, and that divergence in response helps Adam break the theme. Harry's response to mortality is to try and extend his time. He wants to live forever. Swish out time for eventually. Meanwhile, the honeymoon has begun. Peter and Harry reconnect, and Peter reconnects a little bit with Gwen, too. There are action scenes and drama with Gwen planning to move to England. Then at minute 65 or 50% in, Harry calls Peter to ask a favor. I'm dying, he says. And he asks for Spider-Man's blood to heal him. See what's going on here? Harry is trying to live forever. His response to mortality is purely selfish. And this comes up at the midpoint because Harry is the B character. The stakes are raised, the theme is reiterated, and the pressure mounts on Peter all in a single scene. And then things get worse. Peter's relationship with Aunt May breaks down. Spider-Man refuses Harry's request and Harry becomes his enemy. Gwen is really moving to England. And then at minute 95 or 72% in, Peter finds a video from his long dead father. It's an emotional moment that rocks Peter to his core. This is the low point, a reminder of what Peter has lost. Following this moment of doubt, Peter hears from Gwen that she's already en route to the airport. She's leaving now. Meanwhile, Harry takes back the Oscorp building by force and takes some spider venom. This leads us to the break into act three. Peter grabs Gwen and finally reveals that he has a new direction in his life. Rather than being paralyzed by the inevitability of death and living a half-life, he wants to live fully in the present and make the most of his life in support of someone else. This is the magic of structure. By paying attention to these beats, we have learned what the film is trying to tell us. We glimpse its life advice. Life is short, but the way to combat that is to devote your life to others, not to yourself. In the beginning of Act 3, which hits 105 minutes or 80% in, the city is blacked out, and Gwen helps Peter overcome his enemies. By devoting his life to Gwen, Peter is reaping the benefits of a better life. And he's showing us that he's ready to pass the final exam. They work together to defeat Harry, who is now the Green Goblin. But, spoiler alert, at 92%, Peter is tragically unable to save Gwen from dying. Remember that our theme is dealing with limited time. 
Notice this scene happens in a literal clock tower. This is incredibly obvious symbolism, but symbolism nonetheless. Gwen's death constitutes the Act 3 reversal. It underscores that time is limited. We should have spent it more wisely than we did. The denouement concerns Peter's struggle to decide whether to keep being Spider-Man. Eventually, he gets the support he needs from Gwen's valedictory speech. We have to be greater than what we suffer. We have to be greater than what we suffer. That's the trick to living with limited time. At the end of the film, Peter decides to don the suit and goes out fighting crime once more. All right, let's go over that structure one more time. Peter is reminded of how fleeting life is at 12 minutes, the call to adventure. 25% in, Peter acts on this by reaching out to his bereaved friend Harry. At 30%, we find out that Harry has his own ideas about how to live with mortality. 50% in, Harry demands a favor from Peter, and then things get worse. 72% in, Peter is confronted by his father's mortality, and thus his own. By 80%, he's decided to live his life for someone else. But at 92%, Gwen is killed, providing Peter with the ultimate test. Did he really internalize the theme? We find out yes. He did. He will continue living his life for others. Not for Gwen, but for the city of New York. The theme of the film is now fully developed, and it's a theme that is perfectly in line with the character of Spider-Man. Yes, this film has problems. It is unfocused, and I just described the entire story without once mentioning this guy. You know, the one on all the posters for the movie? No. But to the extent you had an emotional response to this film, it's largely because of the theme embedded in its structure. That theme is bigger than the events of the film and bigger than Spider-Man. It is a human universal. It resonates in your soul, like a tuning fork in a wet bag. And I know that some of you are still not convinced. You think this is just confirmation bias, me expecting to find stuff and therefore finding it. But take off your armchair psychologist clown makeup for one second and let's hear what the film's director has to say. I sat down with Alex and we were talking about themes ideas about what the, the, the movie was going to be about. What emerged was this idea about time. You have to value the time you have with the ones you love because time is fleeting. Time is the first shot in the film is uh, inside of a clock. And the final action sequence takes place inside of a clock tower. I rest my case. All right, pop quiz time. Let's say you're making a movie about a boy wizard. The call to adventure is an invitation to a magical school that will make his life a heck of a lot better. At what point in three-act structure should the boy arrive at the school? A, the refusal of the call. B, the honeymoon. C, everything gets worse. Or D, the final exam. Well, it can't be D, because we don't want to wait the whole movie to get there. We'll be pouring out of the cinema halfway through like Botox out of the Hollywood crematorium. And it can't be A, because he has to choose to go to the school, and the refusal is all about refusing to choose. If you choose C, then it undercuts the fun we would have exploring the magical school with a slower pace and lower stakes. So it must be B. How far into Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone does Harry arrive at Hogwarts? 26.4%. The start of Act 2. Good job. I agree. The movies I've discussed all have very different surface stories, but the underpinning structure is the same. The order, tone, and spacing of events is identical, even though the events themselves are different. And they show us the equipment for living beneath a story's surface. Now you know that. So now, like a kid who's found Elon Musk's Twitter password, you have a lot of power. You now know how story structure works. Want to hear the top four uses for that knowledge? One, you can write your own stories, whether they be novels, plays, or movies. Did I mention this structure crosses media? Two, you can now appreciate movies on a deeper level. Rather than judging movies based on, I don't know, how loud the music is, or how unintelligible the dialogue is, or how confused it makes you, you can instead look deeper and scrutinize whether a film's theme is resonating or not. For example, Interstellar is a lazy two-star story, but Ad Astra has one of the best stories I've experienced in a cinema. The difference stems from understanding story structure and also having taste. Three, now that you know how story structure works, you will never be bored watching a movie again, even a bad one because you can entertain yourself by keeping track of the beats. And even bad movies are trying to say something with their structure. National Treasure 2 is a bad movie, but it's about how trust works, and it's symbolized remarkably well in the third act. If you're still not seeing how this knowledge benefits you, try offering to watch a Batman movie with your boyfriend, or a rom-com with your girlfriend. Not only can you now stomach this experience by entertaining yourself with tracking the beats, but you also earn brownie points in the process. Win-win. Four. You can make a YouTube channel where you break down how movie structure why you know why you made a no, no 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 no. I'm doing that. Don't do that. If I see you start another channel copying my idea, I will break into your home and befriend all your pets so that they willingly leave with me, including your house plants, so don't even think about it. Speaking of which, if this video was even remotely illuminating, please subscribe to this terrible idea I already regret doing. I'm planning to release a series of shorter videos on this channel, each one breaking down a single movie, like I did with Amazing Spider-Man 2 here. I'm also half-heartedly thinking about doing other videos on structure. For example, 
Some movies are in five acts, and for some reason, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory has only two acts, but I didn't have time to go through those here. If you want to see those, or specific movies, leave a comment. On a serious note, it is, as a bogan might describe it, hell sick man to be able to watch a movie and understand the heartfelt, handcrafted message of humanity embedded in its act turns. I strongly believe it enriches movies to understand the theme, the point, the transformative subtext at the core, the message from the heart of the screenwriter delivered directly into your own heart through the simple act of unlocking the structure. Remember that every movie is trying to tell you something, even if it's doing a really bad job. You just have to listen properly to hear it. And you have to pay attention to order, tone, and spacing. Sequence, valence, cadence.